Welcome everyone to today's Writing Winning Grant Proposals webinar. I'm Shannon McGarry with Campaign Consultation. We're a training and technical assistance provider with the Corporation for National and Community Service. This webshop is part of a series of monthly webshops that have been designed to provide you with tips and assistance that will help you to navigate your visits to service and to perform the work that you have been assigned by your organization. You on today's call have uh, have been writing grant proposals to foundations and corporations for your organization uh, for a long time at this point, uh, and some of you may be new to grant writing. And truth is that really everyone who works for a nonprofit uh, is responsible for the well-being of the organization, whether or not you're a grant writer or an events coordinator, uh, or perhaps you're a community li liaison. We're writing that today. Uh, there's going to be something for everyone uh, in our webinar. If you go take a look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll notice that we are asking you to answer a few questions. Uh, these polls will really help us to know who's participating in today's webinar and gauge, um, direct, or gauge us uh, to be able to shoot to the needs uh, that you will need uh, moving forward. Today uh, is myself, uh, and then we also have Sharon Rabb, who is with Campaign Consultation, uh, Danielle Rick, uh, who you will notice uh, appearing on your uh, participant panelist as Suzanne Knizner, uh, and Robin Stegman uh, is joining us as well. She'll be helping uh, answer some of the uh, questions that are happening in the chat feature. Over to Danielle, who's going to share with us a few tips for using the WebEx platform. Thanks so much, uh, Shannon, and thank you everyone for joining us. There's just a few things to go over for this web shop. If you lose your internet connection, reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. If you lose your phone connection, dial the number and rejoin. The number is also posted on the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you're having difficulty with, web with WebEx itself, a technical problem, you can call one 866 3239 participants list, there is a chat feature. And at any point during the presentation, please feel free to leave comments in the chat feature for the group. Below that feature, there is a Q&A feature. At any point during the presentation, you may leave questions in the Q&A feature, and we will cover them during that Q&A question and answer portion of this web. And Robin is in the chat in the Q&A section to monitor for you, so there is someone there um, to help guide you through that process. Now, we will be on the site for 30 minutes after the conclusion of this webinar to answer questions in the chat and the Q&A. As um, the operator has mentioned, this web shop is being recorded, but it will be available for you on the Vista Campus tour page along with the archives of pre previous web shops. We have muted your lines for the first part of this presentation, but know that later on we'll open them back up to take your questions. You may also ask questions again in the Q&A section on the right. And please feel free once again to use the chat to discuss relevant information. If you find the chat distracting, however, you can close it by clicking on the arrow to the left of the chat. Now I'd like to introduce Andy King, the VITA Training Specialist. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Andy King, and I work in the VISTA Training Unit. And I feel very fortunate um, to be in the role of helping to create trainings like the sessions you attended at pre-service orientation, um, and, and trainings like this one, our, our ongoing series of webinars. Um, I want to thank you for taking time out of your, your schedule to be with us today and for investing in your own professional development. Here at VISTA, we look at your VISTA year of service uh, as one where you're not only building the capacity of the community and the organization where you're serving, but also a chance for you to build your own capacity, to build your own skills and knowledge throughout the year so that by the time you finish your VISTA service, uh, you will be more accomplished and more ready for what comes next. Um, so I'm glad you've made time for us today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon, um, who's going to take a look at uh, the agenda with us and, and see what we learned from our poll. Shannon? Great. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, so it looks like we have another couple of seconds uh, for people to complete the poll. So over the agenda first. Uh, the first thing that we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be reviewing some facts about uh, foundations, uh, including some of the distinctions and the different types of, types of foundations uh, that are, are out there. 
I will also be talking about where you can find uh, the different foundations that can help to fund your projects. I'll also um, give you some tips uh, and hints about what the funders are looking for when you are uh, completing those proposals so that you'll be able to uh, hopefully receive some of the, the funding that you're seeking. And we'll also talk a little bit about the different uh, foundation visits uh, and then also be providing um, some tips on how you can uh, write the proposal uh, and some good information about that uh, and then different resources that you can access that will help you uh, moving forward to write uh, better proposals. And then finally, we'll review some action steps uh, and next steps that will, uh, can help you get started for writing a proposal away. Uh, and it does look like our evaluation or our polling results have come in. Uh, so for those of you who, ha uh, question number one, have you ever written a grant proposal? It looks uh, like about half of you uh, have already done that, um, but half of you are also uh, newbies. So this will be great because we'll be giving you information for you no matter where you are, whether or not you've done this uh, in the past or this will be your, sort of your first time. Uh, for question number two, are you familiar with what foundations could fund your program? Uh, again, it looks like it's a pretty even split, um, and so we will be providing you with some of those resources uh, today that um, will help you so that you can know uh, where you can go looking for found, uh, foundation funding for the projects that you're involved in. Uh, for those of you who have uh, solicited funds in the past, um, it looks like some of you have done really well with uh, gaining uh, in the form of $1,000 or more, uh, but a lot of you uh, have not necessarily been successful or have not tried, um, and you've not raised money. So this will be great because we'll uh, give you some information and some good stuff that will help to make sure that you are able to access funds in the future. So at time, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon Rabb is going to take us through the rest of today's presentation. Sharon? Good day, everyone. Well, to start us off, uh, a proposal is part of a process, and as such, we thought we'd like to tell you a little bit about foundations and what we do and what you need to know before you start. If you're down in the lower uh, right corner, there's the chart that talks about uh, certain kinds of funders. And you'll see that foundations give about 14% of the money given between corporations, individuals, and foundations. And that num percentage has remained nationwide pretty steady over the, the, a long period of time. I don't show government grants, grant government fund here, but we talk about government funding. That does not figure into the amount of money raised at this point. There are over 100,000 foundations in the United States, and that information comes from the Foundation Center, which is one of the uh, easiest and best informed sources for getting information about foundations. And 2011, which is the last year we have information for that, foundations provided $41.7 billion to nonprofits. We said that they give, over the years, an average of 10 to 12 percent of all giving. Foundations are required by law to uh, give out 5% of the fair market, fat market view of their assets to charitable pur purposes this year, so they have very tight government controls. They have to file an annual information return with the IRS, which lists all the grants that made during the year, their investment holdings, the names of those serving on their board of directors, their application guidelines and process procedures, as well as other information. The public documents, and I'll tell you how you can access uh, that information, and it will not cost you anything. It's a good way to research and find out about foundations. Foundations also primarily do program support. So if you're looking for funds for your program, which I assume you are, um, you're doing a doing by thinking about looking at foundations. Now, is that VISTAs have a wide variety of experience, and uh, some of you you uh, may never have written a grant, and some of you may have written large grants. And you also, the big difference in your programs, and some of you have smaller uh, programs and you're looking for $500 to $1,000, and you also may be part of a development uh, 
program at your organization, which has a number of people on it, and you're only doing a small part of the grant writing. So we hope that this webinar will be able to reach all of your needs. So let's talk about foundation distinctions. There are really two kinds of foundations, private foundations and public foundations. Private foundations usually receive funding from a single source, such as uh, independent or family foundations, and they receive endowments from individuals or families. For example, the um, Melinda Gates Foundation is a family foundation. We have company-sponsored or corporate foundations, and they receive funds from the parent companies. Uh, they are legally separate entities from the company. So the Mark Foundation, for instance, is a broad foundation. They also give out from their marketing and PR budgets, but they have to have the same regulatory conditions as company foundations. Finally, among the private foundations, there are operating foundations which run their own prog programs and uh, services and typically do not provide much grant support to outside organizations. Uh, they will come looking for the programs that they want to fund. An example of that is the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. To talk about public foundations. These are foundations that receive funding from numerous sources and continue to raise money of the moon from diverse sources in order to retain their public charity status. So committee foundations are closed primarily of permanent funds established by many separate donors for the time, long-term charitable benefit of residents of a defined geographic area. An example of that would be something like the New York Community Trust. Another uh, public funding group of foundations are giving circles. And they're made up of individuals who come together to give as a group, meet regularly, share information, and make joint giving decisions. Many of these are uh, women's groups, such as the Women's Fund of Southern Arizona, for instance. Uh, special funds are public funds, are funds serving other population groups and field specific funds, such as the health funding foundations that are set up with proceeds from health care conversions. These are often referred to as, as new health foundations. There are also legal defense funds or public education funds, and uh, usually these do not fund the, your organizations. There are other ways to find foundations, and the ones listed here are just some. There are specific foundation research sites, such as the Foundation Center and Grant Station, uh, yeah, Grant Station and we'll talk about that, that later. Uh, former regional association of grant makers can give you information if you're seeking grants. Don't forget to use the search engine when looking for foundations. So you can just put into a search engine uh, funding children, for instance, or, business or whatever your program need is. And there are influential people on your boards and advisory committees that may have access to, to uh, foundations and maybe even have small private foundations of their own family foundations. Another thing about uh, funders who would be good for you would be to check donor lists of other organizations that provide the same services as you do. Uh, if they're funding a like program, either in a near community or um, in their own community, they may well be interested in funding you too. New foundations and uh, new opportunities. There are several publications listed there, and they will have uh, information about uh, grant opportunities. So if you can take a chance to look at those. If you've identified a funder, you'll want to know as much as you can about the funder, just as you would want to know about an individual before you ask for a major gift. Does the foundation present itself? What is its mission? What groups has it funded? Who staff and board? All foundations file, file an IRS Form 990, and it gives information about grants given, as size, and also their board of directors. And you can use for free. And here, those are two resources where you, you can, can uh, find information. Godstar and GrantSmart both keep us uh, 990 forms on file for you to look at. Foundations uh, have their own websites and corporate websites also often keep 
information that their corporate foundation on their corporate website, but you may have to dig for it a little bit more. Foundation annual reports, and they may be, be put on their website, or you may be, need to write and get a copy of it. And so the annual, uh, CRIT annual reports, they may often keep information about what their foundation funds and, and what the procedure is for accessing those funds. You need to know, when researching foundations, here's what you need to know. This information is usually found in their guidelines. Before you even go that far, take a look at the website, their any report or their corporate center listing. And what you need to know are what types of grants do they make. And that means, do they make uh, program grants? Most of them do. Or are they endowment grants or building grants or different kinds of grants? Uh, next thing you want to know about is what is their field of interest? That means what kinds of programs do they fund in terms of what the programs do? Are they child-centered or do they fund uh, homeless programs? Uh, and you can really find that in the guidelines or in the website or in the foundation center's listing. And be a little flexible in that so that if perhaps you're a homeless organization but you're looking for funding to uh, do a program for children, you'll want to look at both homeless foundations that, that uh, fund homeless programs and foundations that fund children's programs. Most foundations have some geographic interest and uh, geographic restrictions, and you want to pay attention to that. Most, especially family foundations tend to be local either by city or community and sometimes by state. And then there are other larger foundations that would have a big national uh, group. The usual is because foundations usually don't accept proposals on a rolling uh, calendar. But you're certain set at times when their board meets to make decisions about what they're going to do with their money and how they're going to dispense their grants. So pay attention in the guidelines to their schedule. Some are uh, only annual meetings. Some are biannual, twice a year, or quarterly, or, or a few, maybe monthly. But you know that you can have enough lead time to write your proposal and get it in for the deadline. Size grants do they give and for how long? Uh, for thousand dollars, uh, chances are you're not going to go to a foundation whose average gift size is a hundred thousand dollars because you just won't get any attention. And the same thing, if you're looking for five thousand dollars and you see that the largest gift that an organization often has ever made is a thousand dollars. They're not going to be able to fund you too, so you'll get pushed aside. So try to keep your match, match up your uh, fund needs to what the foundation uh, gives. And but if they give just one year, or if they have, for instance, multi-year renewable grants. Next, what I know about is, do you have any connections? And these can be people connections such as people on their board who know people on your board, or vice versa. So when you're looking at a foundation, you're going to want to pass the board lists around to your advisory committee or board or any kind of governing board and see if you can make any connections, because especially with small family foundations or any kind of family foundation, who you know is, is very important. Uh, the guidelines for fundraising is people give to people, and though this is a foundation, there are people behind it. So keep in mind that those connections can be very important for you. And then finally, uh, you want to know what's the initial approach. Do, uh, do they want you to make a phone call first before you do anything? Uh, do they want you to write a short letter uh, before you do a full proposal? Or are they going to ask for a full proposal right off? So I want to talk about what kinds of things funders want to hear from you and what they want to do. And the thing is, remember that foundations must give away 5% of their fair market value of their assets for charitable purposes each year. So they're looking for you to come for them, which is different from individual donors who may try to shy away from you. From that they're looking for a good fit with their priorities. So uh, if they, this is especially the field of interest and, and geographic and uh, money size gifts. So they want to make sure 
for that uh, they're asking for the right amount for the the right uh, project that they fund. I'm interested in creative solutions, and they often fund startup programs and things that might be considered pilot programs, and they are a little bit un perhaps unique and different and a new way to solve a pro problem. So, want measurable results. So, and we'll talk about how to show this later when you're writing a proposal. But please, you want to show, uh, tell them how you are going to measure the effectiveness of your program because they want to know that, that their money is being spent uh, for something that will actually do it. They plan for sustainability, which means that they want the program to continue after they've stopped funding. Foundations only fund for a few years at most, and they won't fund indefinitely. So they want to know that the program is going to continue on after they've stopped their funding. Uh, and they're not totally dependent on them forever. They're perfectly happy, and they actually encourage other funders. A few foundations want to be the sole funder of a project. Uh, they want to see that there are other people in the community, other foundations, that have some kind of investment in the program. And it goes without saying to say that they want a well-written proposal, and we'll talk about the writing of the proposal a little further along, too. And they want to build a relationship. <laughs> They're just like people. Remember, people give to people. So they want to uh, make certain that that uh, they know you and you know them and that it's, this is a, a friend that is being formed. So, uh, foundations do like to talk to you. They like to have you visit, and they may even visit you. So in uh, advance of any proposal submission, you should contact with the foundation and set up an appointment and enter yourselves to the foundation. Uh, if you're an organization and you're still learning about your organization or your community, you can use this as an opportunity to introduce yourself and and get some valuable information about the funder and about the community. Remember that stewardship of past support is as important as the application for a new grant. So uh, talk about when they've given gifts before and know that you're gracious in thanking them for their past support if they have made past support. Um, brief all visitors on the foundation Foundation on the background of the funder and any proposals under consideration. Now, as a FISTA, you may or may not be going on the visit, but you very well may have to prepare an advance report for those people who are going on a visit. So this may be an important part of, of your job, is finding out all about the foundation and its relationship to you and your organization. So agenda, or uh, an agenda, so that you're not wasting anybody's time, and you can make good use of the time. And bring a packet with you with uh, your organization and everything you can uh, do about it, and leave it behind with them so they can take a look uh, while they're after you've gone. Uh, other opportunities that are there. Some uh, foundations have some opportunities that are not published, such as discretionary funds. Uh, so it's not inappropriate to ask if there are other uh, fund streams from this foundation that you might be eligible for. Last, if you're not near the foundation, um, then be sure to set up a call with them and introduce yourself and tell them that you're going to be like you would like to um, submit a proposal and this is what your organization is all about and this is what your program is all about because they do want to hear you. Of, uh, don't, if you, you might receive a call from a foundation that they're coming to visit your program, and this is good news. If you did a proposal, it's mean, it means it's under serious consideration. So it's more about cultivating a relationship. It's a bond between the funders and nonprofit organizations. Citizens provide funders with a feel and understanding of an agency or program. I think a member can speak, speak most eloquently about a program. 
so that's enough for them to to uh, meet. So if there's any information uh, should gather before the funder arrives, make that you have this prepared for them. Participants from your organization, that's everybody who greets them from the person, greets them at the door to the program person, to uh, the executive director about what the foundation is there for, who they are, and what you would like people to say. You might want to be a little bit uh, flexible about the appointments because foundation people are very busy and many times they have to do uh, several site visits within a brief time period. Period. So choose a time that suits your calendar and their calendar, and be available to make changes if you uh, if you need to. Prepare stories that you probably won't get to include in the grant proposal. Uh, some about uh, what your uh, projects have done in the past, and uh, if possible if you can introduce them to some of the people that have been involved in your projects. That's always a good thing. And uh, ask a lot of questions. Uh, you set it up. Uh, what chances for the grant? Ask for suggestions to present a good proposal. Ask if there are any red flags. Uh, if you have any specific questions about the proposal, um, bring them up. Uh, also ask how many people will be coming on the visit because you want to be prepared for then a moment at the end of every site visit to make a checklist of any issues that the funder asks you and to follow up on and make sure that you do and get back to the foundation about these. But we've done our homework. You get down to writing the proposal. We're going to spend a number of uh, minutes and some going over how to actually write the proposal. And we'll talk about proposal contents. Writing the proposal narrative, which is the body of the proposal, talk about the proposal package, and then about following up after you have sent the proposal and it's either been accepted or rejected. So into the proposal, be sure to secure the guidelines and read them well. Many proposals will end up including all of these parts that you have listed here. In some areas, foundations have joined together to accept a common grant application. So you can essentially write one proposal and uh, submit it at different times or simultaneously to several different uh, foundations. And uh, a lot of work, so that always smaller foundations will often do that. So here are parts that are in the proposal. There's a cover letter, a title page and table of contents, an executive summary, which you'll write after you've written the narrative, because it's really a pared-down version, one page of your narrative. And your narrative is going to be eight to ten pages, and there's a number of sections to that which we'll go over. The proposal will also include a budget. Um, the very important part of proposal writing, very often uh, foundations look at the budget first before they even look at the rest of the proposal because they're interested in what your program costs and perhaps what you've raised for it to date and what you're expecting from them. And then have some probably some appendices and supporting materials such as your annual report and some, have some news stories and, and some feature articles or something like that that you want to include to show what you've been doing. Think about the narrative. Okay. A narrative will probably require the most attention, and as I said, it runs eight to ten pages, and this is where the writer in you gets exercised. Part narrative include the statement of need, and this is the statement of the community's need, not your need. Uh, money is understood, but it's not a problem or issue to be addressed in this proposal. So we're talking about what the statement of need is, the, the problem issue to be addressed in your community. We're also going to want to talk in this statement of need about the audience or the community that is uh, that the needs. And you want to supply supporting facts and statistics if you can. And you will need to provide support, supporting facts and, and statistics. So examples of a, a statement 
statement of need, which has been a sentence that we have here, would be something like 80% of the students at Marshall Elementary School are reading one grade or more or related level, or veterans in the community lack meaningful opportunities to integrate. You want to expand on those simple statements to include what the problem is, uh, and you want to describe the community a little bit and include some numbers, if you can, and some statistics. So get the next part, uh, the goals and objectives of the proposal. And talk about goals and objectives. We're going to talk about marked objectives. They sh the go objectives should be specific. We are going to do X, uh, a certain project. Um, the objective should be measured. Well, goals first, by the way, are is, is what is the goal of the program? What do you hope to accomplish? And the objectives are how you're going to do it. So uh, how you're going to do it, you need to talk in terms of specific steps that are measurable, achievable, Realistic and time sensitive. So, smart objectives. Okay. After we've done the goals and objectives, or after the description of the goals and objectives might be, for instance, a goal could be to increase the reading level of students so that they read at a grade level. But you're going to develop this section into three or four pages, so it's more than a single sentence. Your objective steps could be something like. You'll recruit 20 students who are one grade below reading level in grade three. Very specific. Uh, recruit and train 20 volunteer tutors in one year. And you will increase the reading activity of selected students. So those are some examples of objectives for the particular project that we are describing. The uh, methods and the staffing. For the methods, in the case you're using, a tutor will be assigned to work with one student days a week in the classroom. Again, you want to be very specific about what the methods are that you are using. And you also want to be able to tell the funder uh, that these, why do you think these methods will work? Such, For instance, has the curriculum and tutoring method been validated by a reputable authority? Um, is the evidence-based best practice, and are you using it? expand upon your method so that you are being very clear that you, what you're doing is the best thing to do in this situation. And staffing, uh, list out who the people are that are going to be involved in the program. Uh, a supervisor will oversee the program. You always make certain there's a person at the head of, of this particular project. Uh, I've included an, what an AmeriCorps VISTA would do, and I realize that AmeriCorps VISTA is not a member of the staff of the organization, but for a particular case, uh, the AmeriCorps VISTA is a staff of the project. So you need to make certain that uh, it's clear what an AmeriCorps volunteer does and what that person is doing at your organization. And reading specialists who will be contacted to develop a literacy program, so you are adding some professional legitimacy to this particular staff. About evaluation, and there are two kinds of evaluation, the quantitative and qualitative. In the quantitative, uh, we're talking about numbers. Uh, so a post-test will be administered in this case, and the change in the grades will be the numbers that will indicate uh, whether or not your program is successful. Qualitative evaluation is also very valuable, and in this case, we have examples of qualitative evaluations that don't include numbers, such as student folders will provide an ongoing evidence of improvement, so you're keeping portfolios, uh, or anecdotal evidence will be gathered from the teacher. So how the data will be analyzed and what you will do with it after you finish, what will you do with the pre and post scores, what will you call success? And what standards? So then to the part of the project description that talks about sustainability. And what that means is, is the project replicable? Can it be repeated by somebody else? Can it be picked up by another overseer? Um, and also the community that would fund it and uh, keep it going? Is there interest in continued funding? Because remember, 
uh, uh, foundation want to see that their money is being spent on something that is going to be lasting. They don't want to uh, pour money down a black hole. So in case an example of sustainability would be success of this project will lead to adoption by the school system and additional funding will be sought from individuals, local corporations, and foundations. So that's a narrative. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, budget. And the budget is very important. Remember I said some people look at the budget first, or some officials look at the budget first. We have uh, direct costs, expenses, and indirect costs. Directs include your personal and non-personnel, uh, the expenses that you're actually going to spend out of the grant. And then direct costs are any other costs that come up as a result of having the program in your, in your building, perhaps. So you, you're usually given an opportunity to express that in terms of a percentage of the overall direct costs. So that what is the money that is needed to keep the, the heat and the lights and the, the building clean and open uh, is a, appropriate for including in a, in a proposal, uh, but these are indirect costs. Not foundation is going to ask for an income statement, but you may. So if you have received any grants, you will uh, note those there. Or if you have any other sources of income for a particular project, you will note them there. The narrative is where you can use words to explain some of the costs or income, and uh, often is included as a separate sheet. Here we have an example of a sample budget, and it includes the personnel costs, including the benefits and taxes, and personnel costs. Those are direct, um, direct costs. And as a reading specialist there, three days at $500 a day, yeah, she's a person, all right, but she's not part of your organization's personnel. She's a separate contractor, so she would go under non-personnel costs along with all the materials and supplies and that you actually need to make the program run, so those are the total direct costs. And in this case, uh, the indirect costs are 15% of the total direct costs to give you your total budget for that. And there's lots of information that can be gained online about how to do a budget that will best present your project. And my best advice is to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. The next piece of information that a foundation is going to look for after you've got done the budget and the proposal narrative is some information about the organization. And they'll want to know about your mission and history and your, your programs. Uh, and they will want some information about your board and, st your board and staff. And this information may already be ready in your uh, annual report, or if you've written a case support, which every organization should have, and, and is like writing a proposal, but not quite exactly, because it's much more uh, generalized. This information may be available to you, either of those sources. But as a VISTA, you may be the person charged in pulling it all together. The body of the proposal. The next piece is the executive summary. You want to write that after you've completed the other parts of the proposal. And time to be concise and tight in your writing because it's a one page presentation of your proposal. So you want to take out every extraneous piece of information to include a statement of need. Remember, that's the community's need, not your organization's need. Graphs on your goals and objectives, which the, uh, you expect is the outcome of this project and how you're going to get there. They want to have a general statement about the total cost of the project and the amount requested, and this is usually in a sentence. And you can include a paragraph about the background of your organization. There'll be sentences. Uh, every vendor is going to want your IRS determination letter that proves that you're, you are a registered nonprofit, and there are very few foundations that will not that will fund an organization that is not a 501 c 3 organization. Ask for an audited financial statement for.
for your organization, or they just may ask to see a copy of the most recent financial statement. I want to see her here about your board and staff, and these are separate pages in which you uh, do a little bit of a write-up about each of the board or the staff. So you want to include uh, what the board affiliation are, for instance, is he vice president of a certain company in your community, or is uh, a recognized uh, expert in the field, and they would like another pay for your staff. They may or may not ask for staff biographies, but in any case, you'll want to include uh, any kinds of uh, credentials that staff may, may have. And then you can include some your support materials. These are where your news clippings and your quarterly newsletter, posting um, materials that explain your program go, perhaps an annual report. Package. Uh, the cover letter, uh, which is the last thing to be done, is a, an introduction to the proposal. It in, You want to reference any contact, if you've had it recently, or any previous funding. Thank you for meeting with us on February 5th. Uh, please accept this proposal for our program. Uh, it's a request funding. We are asking for $10,000 to support the Homeless Children's After School Program. Uh, of what's in the package, um, like a table of contents, uh, not a table of contents, just a listing. We have included uh, our proposal with some materials in our budget and whatever else, our IRS determination letter. Uh, make sure to meet the uh, funder uh, or answer questions or provide any kinds of additional information. And when you do that, be sure you provide contact information about who is who they should call first to ask about, about the proposal. Then the package after the cover letter is the proposal itself with all that um, we talked about, about the uh, executive summary and the, and the uh, body of the proposal and the budget. Any supplemental materials, your brochures, annual reports, newsletters, etc. The project should take from two weeks to several months, depending on the complexity of the project and the funder's needs. So uh, it's possible to get a proposal out in, in two weeks if it's a relatively small one, uh, but you may need to take as much as a couple of months because you need to send the proposal around to various experts in the area, to the program people, to the executive director, and everyone else that needs to have some input in it. Be very careful to keep uh, contact with the funder and follow their gui guidelines. The guidelines are very, usually very specific, and so you want to make certain that you've included everything they've asked for. You can talk to the funder. Um, they're usually pretty willing to help you along the way. Um, I had a, went to a foundation that somebody told me I should go to, but looking at them, it didn't look like they were a very good match for our program. But by talking with the program officer, she was able to tell me how I could frame the proposal so that indeed it was a very good match for their their uh, their prize, and we did get the grant. So talking to the funder is very important. You might want to brainstorm with some people, the program person, perhaps the budget person, uh, the, anyone else who in the organization who might have some knowledge about the program that can talk to you about it and figure out how best to frame this statement and make an outline. And without saying, it goes to say that you should uh, write in correct English and avoid uh, jargons and acronyms that. Uh, are specific to your organization. Uh, you want to keep this uh, and and reading of it uh, very clear and understandable to everybody. And to do that, you might want to give that to an outside reader, somebody who has no connection with your program and doesn't really know about it. And if that person can understand what you're asking for, then you've got, probably got a, a good proposal that you can can submit. And of course, you want to uh, have it delivered in time, so when you set off, do so according to the instructions so that it gets there by the due date. Sometimes you can deliver it by hand. Some, organizations, some funders say that you have to have it postmarked by a certain time. 
Um, I'll include uh, a site for you where you can find sample proposals and these follow-up resources that will be mailed to you. And I'm, I've asked, I'm asking you to think about some resources of your own that you may have used that have been helpful. So the part of this proposal writing process is uh, for you get it. So you, well, like you do any other gift, you say thank you. Um, you've made reviews, and there's been a grant, and don't stop. Um, make sure that you can contact with the funder and send them things like newsletters, uh, give them credit in your annual report, invite their representatives to some of your events, provide timely reports. Are you ready for the next round of funding? Well, get the grant. Remember, it's personal. Most of us receive many, many more proposals than they can fund. You can contact the funder and ask why your proposal did not receive funding. That is not an, anything you sh should not do. Because it may be, it's a matter of time before your name comes up. You may have to submit several times, and, and there's um, oh, a sort of a pain of, from, of uh, commitments that they have before you can be funded. So think about future funding and if there's any chance changes uh, that you need to make in your proposals and keep on trying and then write more proposals because you will get better with practice. So now I'd like to open the phone lines to answer your questions and to uh, some of the questions in the uh, um, K. Um, Karen, are you there? Can we answer the phone? Yeah. If you have a question on the phones, please press star 1 on the keypad of your phone. Please mute your phone and record your name at the prompt. Your name is required to introduce your question. That is star 1 for a question. You may withdraw your request by pressing star 2. One moment, please. We'll wait for the first question. And while we're waiting for the questions, do you see anything in the Q&A which uh, people have asked that we could answer? Yes, I did. Um, question here from... Uh, Sherry Mills, who asks, should you try for more than one grant or find one grant that meets the amount you need? So, um, either way. Uh, it, you know, as I say, funders like to have partners. So, uh, depending on how much you're asking, um, they would expect you to submit to other foundations also. So have individual funders and corporations that will make up support for your program. You can write multiple grants for your program for uh, the, the project. Great. Another question. Um, I find it harder to find grants, especially local, that fit capital campaigns. Do you have any suggestions? Well, you probably want to schedule, if there's a community foundation at all in your area, you might want to um, schedule an appointment with somebody there and then person can probably be very helpful to you. We're going to have a list of resources for how to find grants. Uh, if one of the best sources for searching for grants is the uh, Foundation Center, and you can plug in. That's one of the uh, kinds of funding that they do that you plug in. So if you're looking for building funds, capital funds, if you look you know, that into the search process of your um, so are foundations in your local area that fund um, capital projects, you hopefully will come up with a few of them that you can approach. Okay, and there's a follow-up question in the chat, which is, if you work with an organization that works throughout the state, is it okay to apply for community grants that funds areas where some projects take place but your oh, yeah. org's office isn't located in? Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can certainly localize your request to a certain foundation that funds locally doing work in that area. How do you how do you rectify sustainability for ongoing needs that can't be sustained without funds? And the example is they're looking for funds that help get interpreters for translating materials both now and in the future. You would prom you might want to establish a, a sustainability fund and run a, a particular campaign for that that would incorporate both individual or individuals, corporations, and foundations. That would be a way to indicate that, that you 
are uh, hoping to have some funds for the future. And then and best funding is naturally from individuals. As I think if you remember that chart, uh, it's like eighty percent of the funding for all programs comes from individuals. So at some point along the line, you do want to develop a uh, program to uh, promote individuals about funding. Translators, there are probably a number of sources in cultural groups that, that you can seek out. Um, another question. I have a hard time finding reliable statistics on literacy in Texas because the latest study was done at the 2000 census. Any advice for how to get statistics for grants? Okay, very local question, and I might throw that one out to uh, on the pro on the line and see if anyone is there on this webinar who knows about Texas and can make those suggestions. We're going to have uh, another question and answer session in a few minutes in which uh, we are going to ask you to give your resources and your tips. And so I'm hoping that I can't answer a specific question like that. Great. Um, I told by many funders that they do not want us to approach them to set up a meeting. Do you have any advice about how to best best approach funders with knowing whether they may be open to a meeting with a member of our staff? You mean they do and you still want to go ahead and, and make a, an appointment, I think is what that person is trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, somebody on their board is a connection to somebody on your board, and that might be the best way to do it. And if they say absolutely not, then you have to adhere by their rules and some letter or something that tells them about what you're doing and why you would like to get funding from them and um, see if they will allow you to submit a proposal. And they, it, usually those kinds of things, uh, foundations uh, ask you to write a letter first before you write, before they'll give you permission to write a proposal. And from your letter, uh, they can tell if you're going to do something that they want to fund some aware of very much of what the guidelines and priorities are so that you can get a positive answer to proceed with the next step, which is to write the proposal. The question I have is, do you have any advice for funding operational funds of an organization versus programmatic funding? Those operational funds most often come from individuals, and you need to develop an annual fund program to solicit individuals. There are a few local organizations that may fund operational funds, but those foundations usually like to fund short-term projects where they can see the results of their money in a fairly short period of time. Uh, there are too many that fund operational funds. Sometimes local, uh, local foundations will become attached to your organization and you will get funding year after year after year. So if you could find a local foundation that you know, has an affinity for your organization, then that's spread. Bet. Okay. And do we have uh, questions? We do have questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from Daniel Ronan. Go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Um, so I guess I just had a general question about um, funders and um, – Campaign. So, what what I realized as being a part of a small nonprofit in Northeast Portland is that going to a larger foundation with um, a capital campaign request is sort of a, a larger undertaking, um, mm -hmm. when, especially when the foundation is over a certain size. Um, that it seems that our amount isn't high enough. Yeah. Um, so, I guess I'm, and our board is not particularly connected. Uh, with other boards and with existing foundations, and I'm you know, from Portland, Oregon, so we're not a really necessarily moneyed part of the country. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if you have any suggestions as to um, looking at other opportunities for fundraising and, I don't know, maybe pitch a different direction in order to meet with our fundraising goals. Um, you might want to make an appointment. Is there a local foundation uh, community? Community foundation in your area? You I got that suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good start. And have you have you run your needs and uh, what you're looking for through the foundation center? Um, 
I'm sorry if I didn't. Have you looked at the Foundation Center for Funders? No, that's a, that's a new resource that I just learned about over this call, okay, so well, we'll be sure to look at that. That's a very good one and a very helpful one, and we'll show you in a few minutes uh, how to access the Foundation Center. It can be for free at local libraries on their some help mm -hmm. online, and you can also pay for a subscription to the an annual subscription to the Foundation Center. Allows you to use the online resources in your office. Okay, great. From Angela Stewart. Go ahead, your line is open. Hi, I was. I'm interested in finding how to locate local individual donors and find out what their programs or what they're interested in supporting. You know, 73% of the individual. Okay, well, that's a whole other webinar. Uh, but uh, individual donors can be. Have you? Do you have an annual fund program for your organization? Oh, anything for my Okay. Own. Well, you need to start thinking about looking at an annual fund in which you uh, build up a body of donors, individuals, who will support your program year after year. And these are the people who usually keep your lights on and keep you going. And they can be found in a number of different ways. And one of them is uh, by doing perhaps community-wide events that bring people to see some aspects of your organization or is your organization in action and at that point you want to collect some names and addresses and, and phone numbers and email addresses and start there and that will give you a, a group of people who are interested in your program. Okay. This okay. Now they know whether they were donors or not. Well they won't be at first. Okay, so you kinda make them donors. Right. You wonder in you have to interest the people in your in your program first before you can ask them for money. So perhaps some kind of an, uh, participating in some kind of an event uh, would be one way you could do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Question comes from Brian Like. Go ahead. Your line is open. First off, I just wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation so far. Thank you. <laughs> I did have a couple more questions, so. I um, or rather, I'd just like you to speak on on, on the subject of micro grants and also emergency grants. Or just quick, quick response. Yeah. They might have um, a different name. Uh, uh, micro those these usually come from individuals, although not always. Uh, and again, I want to send you to uh, your community, local community foundation. Uh, if they have uh, some or ideas about that because those are usually very, very local community oriented. Same with emergency response grants. Um, from, uh, the community foundation or your your uh, local United Way will often have grants in that area. Um, and uh, I guess my question was more specific. How what's a great way to win those grants? Oh, win them. Um, um, mm -hmm. Be very clear about presenting the need and how you will respond to that need and how you know that this is the most effective way and you are the best qualified organization to uh, meet this need. So in your writing of the narrative, gotcha. goals and uh, methods. And Eckley, could you recommend one great book about fundraising? Um, Gosh, I probably can, but I can't, don't have them at the top of my head. Anything by Gerald Pennas, P-A-N-N-A-S, is probably good, J-E-R-O-L-D. Uh, Kim, oh, Kim Klein writes a number of books, especially about grassroots fundraising. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. It comes from Samantha. I did not get your last name, Samantha, but your line is open. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so this year, my program, we're trying to start building like a um, donor base for this is our final year of a pilot program, and next year we hope to launch. So really in the beginning phases and trying to make those connections. And um, I work at the United Way, so they're embedded in the community and already have a very strong donor base. And one idea I had for this year was just to help some individuals and corporate and businesses and patients um, they'd be interested in funding a program like the one that we offer 
and at the end of this year, um, recommendations to the United Way for them to either continue or not. So I was wondering if kind of doing surveys and asking people if they would in the future be interested in funding, is that something that organizations do or is there a different approach I should be taking? You mean people who are already funding your program, if they would be interested in continuing it? Or we don't get any. Uh, we only, there's only discretionary funds used for the past three years on this pilot program that I work on. We don't have anything outside of the organization. So, uh, uh, again, I want to suggest your local community foundation. Uh, it's a great source of getting the feel of funders in the area because uh, community foundations oversee a number of your smaller foundations and they might be more aware of who in your community is funding that kind of program. Okay. Would it be like out of or inappropriate to like reach out to businesses and corporations and individuals and ask them if they would be interested in funding a program and not going through just foundations? Oh, uh, sure, but um, that's a it's an extra step. Uh -huh. I think the, the, what you want is just go ahead and ask them, uh, activate them a little bit. You know, give them an opportunity. Okay. To, to know your program, uh, introduce yourself and introduce the program, and then ask them straight out. Don't say be interested because they'll say yes, but then when it comes time to say, well, we'd like to have $500, and they'll say, sorry, we can't give that right now. So you, gotcha. you don't need that extra step. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have other questions at this time. Okay, well, we will answer the rest of the questions in the Q&A, but I want to move on at this point to give you some resources that are available both on the VISTA campus and in other sources. So as a quick look at what's on the VISTA campus, uh, I'm sure you've all been using the, I hope you've all been using the VISTA campus because there are many, many good resources on it. Most of the resources will be found in the work section of the campus. And as you see that, that's that middle box or that middle tab. And the section in the work section of the campus called fundraising. And that top middle box and inside that um, there are a number of different uh, resources that you can go to that have to do specifically with writing proposals. And um, for the next slide, we can point out exactly where, what they are. So on the campus, there are the first two tools that are on the campus building your case for support and producing proposals that work uh, are uh, interactive tools that when you open them and work through them, you will actually come up with a finalized case for support or a generalized proposal, uh, one where it doesn't have two specific guidelines that you have to follow. And so a traditional course called writing proposals, and uh, that's uh, very helpful in learning many of the same things that we talked about on the slides. By the way, these resources will be part Part of the material sent to you after this webinar, so you will have all the information about what resources are available. Other resources, you've heard me talk about the Foundation Center, and this is a wonderful uh, resource that can provide research information for foundations in addition to some proposal writing resources. So in the started section, you'll find that there are tools available for uh, writing proposals and how to do the research and uh, what to um, look for when you're, you're doing this. And these tools at the Foundation Center are available for free online. You can subscribe at a various range of costs that start at about $200 a year and go to about 1000 and those will provide you uh, in stronger searches. So it will allow you to look for very specific things uh, which would fund your program when you punch the, the requirements that your program has. And so the Foundation Center also has some libraries around the country. There's one in every state that's available for free, uh, at least one in every state. Sometimes there are, are, are more, and they're available at that, that, that email address there if you look for the Foundation Center libraries or Foundation Center repositories. Grant space is service of the Foundation Center, and it provides training in, a, in addition to sample grants and forums and chat rooms. So it's a good educational uh, for learning about how to do grants. And the University of Wisconsin is a good one, and it has advice and tips for writing proposals, including federal grants and proposals. 
So I said we were, we, the, the many of the the rules for writing uh, government grants were the very similar to or the same as writing a proposal in general. Associated Grant Makers is a an organization that is a New England based organization, but some very good training resources. And Stop Gov will uh, help you search for government grants. So I'd like to open the phone again, and Tom, I want to ask for your tips and resources. So if you've uh, found something as you've been writing proposals um, that has worked well for you, because you've had some success in writing proposals. I know there were a number of people online, at least 40-some, who actually had gotten grants for $10,000 or more. So I'd love to hear from you and hear about how you went, you managed to do that. So, Sharon, can we uh, open these, the line again? Absolutely. At this time, we'll do another question and answer session. Please press star 1 if you wish to ask a question. Remember to unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Again, okay. your request, press star 2. Okay. And um, well, here I want to uh, point out that on you in the work form on the KISS, there is a question about have you ever written a grant, so a grant proposal. I would love it if after this this uh well, we would go there and offer some tips and ideas about what you have done to um write grants and how you write proposals and how you have been successful and learned in the process. And maybe you've been unsuccessful but you learned something very important. So I'd like to hear about that too. Okay, Vinny. Question, but I caught just tail end of the name, so I didn't catch that. If you did press star one, your line is open. Yes, yes. you can. Okay. Um, wanted to uh, give some advice. Um, a good way to write a good, um, good and successful grant is to look at uh, higher grants that have been approved and you know try to mimic the language. See what it is. You know the points that were that were being made that you know correspond to the points that you're to make uh, that were successful. Um, that's uh, a really good idea and some advice that my grant writing professor had given me at school. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I should have included that. Yeah, so if your organization has been writing grants, then look at what they've done before. I didn't get a recorded name. If you did press star one to ask a question or make a comment, your line is open. Check in, please. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. I am so glad that you guys are doing um, this this type of webinar. Um, my question, well, my response is that. Um, written several grants um, for the county. Well, I live in Miami, so we have the county and the city. And what I saw that is helpful is, is to follow steps that you have given previously and mm -hmm. making sure that you answer the questions, all questions, yeah. and making sure that you go through the quali qualification part of it to make mm -hmm. sure your organization is meeting the goals that you are looking for. Yes, as I say, be very careful. When you uh, think you finished the grant, go back to the guidelines again and check off each, each section very carefully to make sure that you have adequately responded to what they're asking. Thank you. Further at this time. Okay. Well, yes? All right, we have um, some additional questions that have popped up in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, Do you answer some of those now? Yes, let's answer some of them. If we have a lot more, we'll go on and uh, then yeah. stay on the line after the web is finished. But if we can take a few more from there. Yes. Okay, great. Um, one question is, um, what do you do if you're a new organization and you're trying to seek funding but you don't um, have your 501c3 yet? 
if you can show that you have applied for it, and there usually is there's sometimes a waiting period, uh, you may you probably okay to go ahead and submit and explain that that 501c3 has been applied for. Um, what if you are considered a nonprofit but you don't have that 501c3 designation? Well, if you're considered a nonprofit and you don't, then you perhaps you get the designation. Uh, I don't know if there's a reason why they don't have the, the designation. Uh, foundations do want to know that you have. It's a sort of a, a validation that you're running the operation legitimately, and to know that you're doing that. So if you don't have one and don't have any intention of getting one, uh, then foundations are probably not going to look very closely at you. Um, and do you have any tips on being letters of intent to organizations that you have uh, little, not a lot of information on? I don't have any information on. Okay, personally, uh, you found out about the the funder somewhere. So if a connection from somebody, perhaps on your advisory board or something, mentioned brought them to your attention, uh, then explained who they are and. Uh, Try to get some information either from the foundation center or from uh, you know, perhaps a small family function may have come as a result of a connection someone on your board made. So find out about what. Oh, the five. I'm sorry. I know what you, where you can go. The uh, IR 990. Um, it's for free. You go to Guide Star. You tap in the name of the uh, and foundations are nonprofits, by the way. Because they raise, they have raised funds too, and they're they're under that um, 5C3 designation. So go to GuideStar and see what you can find out about the foundation, and in terms of who's on their board, what they have funded before, uh, how much they've been funding, uh, what their net worth is, uh, what the size of their grants are. That's the same. You, know, you can get information on foundations. It's public information and is available for you. Few more, but we can wait till the end of the presentation. Okay, so we're going to move on and uh, just do more things, and then, as I said, we will stay on the line. We also will be uh, sending out the slides at the end of this program and uh, any chat session that's relevant and uh, if it needs to be answered. And uh, the webinar will also be posted on the webinars for Vista page in about two weeks, so we can go back to it then. You can go back to it then, too. So let's take a look at some next steps. Um, first, we're going to ask you to take a course in either the fundraising or the communication and marketing section on the VISTA campus. Uh, we include the communication and marketing because there's uh, some very good materials there on our ring and how to communicate with stakeholders, and, and foundations are stakeholders. Uh, it's just a forum for ideas on writing proposals or post a message with a new question. And there is a question that, there now, so you can go ahead and answer that one. Or uh, I think this question has been posted before. Every so once in a while we, got, we get somebody who says, I need to write a grant and I never have. What should I do? So look for those. Uh, for other proposal writing resources, either at the Foundation Center or at Grant Station, or for other sites that would be valuable. And, and if you're um, doing uh, government proposals, look at some of those uh, government proposal sites that we have posted in the resources. And the resources will be sent out separately, too. And so finally, attend a local fundraising sh uh, workshop. Uh, these are often offered by community foundations or regional associations of grant makers, and you can find those listed on the givingform.org. And here on the lower uh, right-hand side of your screen, you will see that we have an evaluation, and I hope you take a minute or two to go ahead and complete the questions in that uh, query. Uh, so that we can see how we can improve these webinars for your needs. One of the questions is, what other topics would you like? And we always want to know what you want to know. So, thank you. Uh, that's it for grants and writing grants and proposals. Writing grants and proposals. Next month, we'll offer Using the Education Award. And this will be on Wednesday, the 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can sign up on the webinars for this page accessed 
by the ongoing learning button on the front page of your VISTA campus or on the VISTA events calendar. The webinar has been recorded and, and it will be available along with a copy of the slides on the webinars for VISTA page in about two weeks. You may also be interested in our social media Monday events. And the one coming up is using Twitter to mobilize your community, and that will occur on Monday, December 3rd at 3 o'clock. If you have further questions after we've signed off this webinar or you need more information, you can contact us at Vista Campus at campaignconsultation.com. And uh, we'll sign off the portion. No, we can't. No, we won't. We, we will not open the lines again, but we will take a, another look at the questions in the question and answer session and uh, try to answer those. So we'll be staying on the line for a little bit. Bit, this webinar. And thanks for giving.